Hi, good evening. We are about to begin the final session of Systema 2020. Now, I request everybody to please switch off your microphones. Now, I welcome you all to the final session at Systema 2020. The session will be handled by Dr. Victor Fernandez Oliveira de Miranda, Associate Professor at the Sao Paulo State University, Brazil. Dr. Victor Miranda, a prominent Brazilian botanist, is an associate professor at the Sao Paulo State University, Department of Applied Biology. He received his master's degree and doctoral degree in biological sciences from Sao Paulo State University, Rio Carlo campus, and pre-teaching from Sao Paulo State University, Jaboticabo campus. He's also a visiting, pro a visiting professor at prominent universities and a curator of panorograms of Herbaria Djibouti. He's a coordinator of the graduate program in agronomy at Sao Paulo State University. He takes courses for undergraduate, co undergraduate courses related to plant systematics and for graduate courses related to phylogenetic systematics and molecular evolution. He's also the member of the editorial board of prominent international journals such as Frontiers in Plant Science, which is published from Switzerland, and Italian Botanist, which is published from Italy. He's also a reviewer of many national and international journals. A prolific academician, he has published many papers in journals of international repute, published book chapters, and has compiled the book. The research interests include botany, evolutionary biology, and systematics, with main studies on systematics, evolution, and genetics of his research team is currently working on the phylogenomics of lendibularaceae with emphasis on neotropical taxa of dendlicia and utricularia. It's a pleasure to welcome him to deliver a talk at Systema 2020 on molecular systematics, genomics, and evolution of carnivorous plant group lendibularaceae. I welcome you, sir. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Sir, we can't hear you, sir. We can see the slides, but we can't hear you. I think his microphone is switched off. No, sir. Actually, his mics are on, but we can't hear yeah.
Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Hi, sir. Yes, yeah, yes, you're sir. Right, but... oh, yes, now okay. we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. The problem was the somebody here. Sorry. <laughs> well, I put the presentation just a minute. Can you see the slide? Yes, sir, we can see the slide. Well, great, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kumar, and also all the committee for this invitation. For me, is a satisfaction to be here and do this uh, presentation for you as you had introduced me. I am Professor Vitor Miranda from Sao Paulo State University, Associate Professor at UNESP in Brazil. And the focus of our researchers in our lab is linked to Blariace family, considering different aspects, including molecular semantics, genomics, and evolution. And today, the idea here is to show you some points we are working on, some focus we are doing in our researches in our lab, and also to conduct some discussion about particularly on the molecular systematics and also genomics and evolution. Okay, well, let's go. Mm, firstly, I want to uh, present, I don't know if for you is a um, familiar issue, but carnivorous plants. Lintibularia family is a carnivorous plant, it's a group of carnivorous plants. And carnivor carnivory in plants are not so common. Indeed, they actually are very, uh, if we consider, if one considers all the angiosperms, we have less than 0.3% uh, in all, considering all the angiosperms. It's a very small group inside the, among the, all the angiosperms. Uh, less than 1,000 species is too few species if you consider the plants as a whole. All, most of the carnivorous plants are angiosperms. With, there is some other groups, for instance, as mosses, colura and pleurosia are two genera, uh, but usually the carnivorous plants are angiosperms. Well, where, do you find, where, where can we find the carnivorous plants? In all the world, we can find the carnivorous plants. Usually, they are the terrestrial plants or even aquatic species. Some of them uh, have different life forms. For instance, the rheophytes in waterfall, or waterfalls or streams, or even as epiphytes, or even on rocks. And the, all these species have some common characteristics. For instance, the point is that these groups developed an alternative way for providing nutrients, usually nitrogen and also phosphorus. That's the why the carnivorous in plants. And also, usually they are, for instance, they are found in sunny and also sweat areas, usually related with water. It's very common. Well, to be a carnivorous plant, what the plant, what the plant need, what, what does the plant need? To capture the prey, to kill the prey, to digest the prey, and also absorb the products resulted from the digestion. For that, this kind of plants have to be a lot of specializations, not only morphological specializations, but also um, and those metabolic specializations. And also, they have to produce some enzymes, for instance, to absorb the, 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 the material from the prey. Uh, to, to sorry to the, the digest the material from the prey and also absorb these nutrients and a very common characteristic is in carnivorous plants that most of them have very poor uh, very poor roots this is very common in carnivorous plants possibly because considering in um, evolution view why to have too much developed roots if they can uh, acquire the nutrients from the, the leaves. That's, it's not interesting to produce developed roots. One question, one question, why, why carnivorous and not insectivorous? This is, I think it's 
a little bit interesting question because if we say insectivorous plants, we are restricting the prey for these plants because the insects are not the only prey for these plants, but also there is other groups of animals that can be prey, for instance, uh, fish larvae and also tadpoles and also other small vertebrates. For instance, in Nepenthes, <clears throat> a common plant, including in India, in Asia, and also Indonesia, and in other island and, and, and other, not here in South America. But this plant, there is a, a huge trap, and this trap sometimes can trap and trap, uh, not usually very big, but vertebrates, for instance, lizards, or also small birds. This is more or less common. So if you say insectivorous plants, plants, we are restricting the prey for these plants. That's the point. So it's better to call them as carnivorous plants. Okay. Well, <clears throat> the carnivorous plants are all this here. Here is uh, here are most of the, the the families, the groups of carnivorous plants. When we say carnivorous plants, we are referring a a group of plants, but artificial group of plants. It's it's like to say, oh, the trees or all oh, the herbs as a general. The carnivorous plants are a heterogeneous group, and in this group there is different families. For instance, lentibular is a family, uh, and also there is a race of family, Nepenthesia family, and all these families are not usually necessarily related from evolutionary from a uh, phylogenetic point of view, considering the evolution, the carnivorous, uh, the, the carnivory are, are arrived at different times in the plant lineage, at least nine times in nine different events independently. Okay, well, and here the focus will be Lentibularia family. Lentibularia comprehend three genera, Denlisia, that is common in South America and also Africa. Pinguicula in all the world, except <laughs> South, uh, uh, here in Brazil, but it's called is, uh, in some parts of South America, can be found, and also in the extreme south, uh, south of South America, and the Tricularia. And this is the group I will show you in this presentation. Here you can see the evolution of the plants, and here is lentibular variation. Well, as you can see, the carnivory in angiosperms arrived at different times in the evolution. So what, what uh, happened here? It was a situation of convergent evolution. Since these plants are found in poor habitats, poor nitrogen and also phosphorus, poor habitats, so that's the why we, we uh, these plants evolved with these traits and very interesting and convergent and similar uh, characteristics. For instance, several species has pitfalls, for instance, cephalotus in Australia or even Nepenthes in Asia, Africa and other parts of the world. And also Saracenia here in America, for instance, North America particularly, and also South America, considering Elieu for how, as you can see, they are different groups, but these groups has have very similar traps, convergent evolution. Well, and here we have the order Lamialis, and on in the uh, Lamialis order we can find this family Lentibulariaceae, Lentibulariaceae with these three genera: Pinguicula, Genlisia, and also Utricularia. Okay, and this group I'll show you now and that this is the group that is the model the, 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 that we use here in our lab considering the biology considering several uh, different areas of knowledge um, this is the genera utricularia with around 240 species genesia with 31 species and pinguicula with 100 species well this is this plants are similar of course they are from the same family but also there are different characteristics considering the three genera the flowers is very similar but the traps are completely different for instance if we see 
In weakly species, pinguicula, there is roots. This is other characteristics common to the genus. But Genesia and also Utricularia have no roots. Okay. Other characteristics: the traps. All the uh, for for all the three genera, the traps are the leaves. But here in pinguicula, the species have, possess stick leaves okay the it is produces mucilage on the leaves and the leaves are the traps well but considering in Lisa and also tricularia they have very specialized traps for instance in Genesia, the traps are leaves specialized leaves uh, with no chlorophyll the leaves are under the ground and these leaves are to be lobed by lobed and also twisted twisted in each lobe so the, the small prey can go inside of these spaces and go to up and here there is a utrico that's more or less like a stomach in the plant <clears throat> sorry and here are produced enzymes and the prey are digested and here we have a tricolaria a tricolaria differently from the gynesium has traps as vesicles here is the vesicles usually few millimeters two millimeters four millimeters seven or eight millimeters and these traps uh, can catch the small animals i will show you here the pinguicula genus a very beautiful species very ornamental species indeed <laughs> here pinguicula jack in cuba very beautiful one here other pinguicula well you can realize here a lot of glands on the leaves and these glands are responsible for glue for uh, sticking the small animals usually very small insects flies and other small insects here Gen Genesia genus genus Genesia has two types of leaves here the leaves responsible for photosynthesis and here the leaves responsible for catching prey prey and here that the prey can go inside and those uh, uh, go to up and here are produced enzymes that digest the small animals here you can see a bladder of one Genesia and inside as I told you is produced enzymes and also there is a lot of bacteria and these bacteria are possibly uh, are responsible also for uh, the, the production of some substances responsible for also for digestion here Genesia aurea um, common species here in Brazil a big Genesia actually here you can you can see the traps and here the leaf is responsible for carnivora. It's very common for some species, for instance, Genesia aurea or even Genesia tuberosa. We can find a lot of mucilage on the leaves. We don't know which is the function of this mucilage, possibly to uh, avoid the desiccation of the leaves or even because of some uh, some systems of mutualism with bacteria maybe we don't know here in Galicia violacea other common species here in brazil Galicia violacea is very polymorphic species we can find different forms very including uh, in the same place very uh, close geographically close some of them with purple flowers some of them with white flowers and it's a very beautiful species well and utricularia Utricularia is around 200 and a half species. We can find Utricularia in the other world, okay? And we can find terrestrial species, aquatic species, epiphytes, rheophytes, and also lithophytes. Usually, some species are very tiny, few millimeters in deep, and also some of them with up to some meters. The traps is modified leaves, and we call them as utricos or bladders okay but this is the traps the traps are specialized specialized leaves that can and suck the species suck the prey inside and produce enzymes to digest them 
Well, one very, one very important trait characteristics of this group is the genome sizes, particularly uh, characteristic very mm, uh, interesting considering the evolution of genomes. These plants have the smallest genomes known to seed plants, some of them with less than one megabases. Uh, particularly the smallest genome, no genome is Genesia with uh, 60 megabases. Here it's possible to see the, where we can find Tricularia, a lot of species here in South America and also Asia, particularly uh, Australia also. This is the three places, the continents, that there is the most, most species can be found, okay? And some of them are uh, shared between the continents. But we can see a lot of endemism. The endemism rate is uh, very high, considering some parts of the world, usually, uh, particularly in neotropics and also considering the Australian continent. Um, this is a raptor guide we have produced in our group. This kind of, of guide, raptor guide, is, is, is called, um, is organized by the Field Museum and EOS, and we are periodically producing, and the idea is to produce more, is the list of the species, and also not, not only the list of the species, but also a raptor guide with the photos, it's very interesting considering to as as a conservation tool for education to show to show to students and also visitants in the national parks for instance and here is one we produce for sao paulo state this is some of the species in sao paulo state and here you can see some genese species and here some utricularia species um, aquatic species and also terrestrial species and as you can see there is a, a, a huge diversity considering the life forms and here too the, 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 a guide produced for Rio de Janeiro state and here also we can find some species and here is to Serra da Canastra. Serra da Canastra it's a group of mountains in Minas Gerais state there is a very important national park that uh, in, uh, in that where this mountain is and there is a lot of us also of species here you can see some of them as i told you some species are aquatic some species are terrestrial like the tricularia ispida some species uh, are submerged aquatic some species are live sometimes depending on the, the season in the water submerged or out of the water, depending on the species. Here you can see the phylogeny of the groups. As here, we, what we call this is a cladogram. There is a lot of cladograms, different topologies of different topologies in the same plate, and we can find the convergence of the history, phylogenetic history, and considering the life forms is possible to see that the terrestrial form possibly is a plesiomorph, the primitive form for the group. But considering the different life forms, it's possible to realize that mm, different life forms has arri have arrived at different times in the history, in the evolutionary history of the group. For instance, aquatic species arise at least twice, real fights, the plants that live in the rocks, in the stream, the rapid streams, in the waterfalls, uh, arise at least twice also. This is very curious, this is very interesting indeed, because uh, when we say the real fight, we are not considering only one group, but different groups of plants. When we say aquatic species, we are referring to different groups of aquatic species, convergent evolution. Here we can see the size of the plants. Some of them are teeny, for instance, the Tricularia pusilla. As you can see here in Brazil, this is my finger, <laughs> very tiny. Here, Tricularia livacea. Look, this is the flower, an open flower, open white flower. And the one question we have is, which is the pollinator of this species? 
<laughs> possibly small flies. We don't know, indeed. And here, tricolor biovlarioides. See the, the size of these flowers. Amazing. <laughs> By the other hand, we can see some of some plants with uh, some meters long. For instance, Utricularia foliosa, a very common species here in lakes, in calm lakes here in Brazil, not rapid streams, it's not common. And these species can uh, reproduce clonally very effectively. It's very common we find a lot of plants in the same lake, but when we check the genetic of these species, we can see that these species are all, these plants these are all clones from the same plant. <clears throat> Again, Utricularia foliosa, a very beautiful species indeed. Here we can see Utricularia longifolia. Utricularia longifolia is a species with huge leaves, as you can see. Here is the, this photo is only to show you the size of the leaf. This is the uh, longest leaf record to the date to the species, one meter and 75 centimeters. Amazing, this is amazing. But indeed, possibly some plants do not have uh, indeed leaves, but possibly this could, this is uh, cladodes stems, okay, flattened stems. Here is possible to see Trigularia flaccida and a lot. This is the traps. Here you can see the leaves and also here the traps. Okay, this is the traps responsible for catching prey. Here also you can see the traps of these species. Here the leaves and here the traps. This is a trap. As I told you, this is responsible for catching prey. The prey, for instance, microcrustaceans and touch some. Uh, sensible hairs and this there there is here a kind of opercle a kind of a uh, door and the door is open and the food the, the water flow bring the brain side of the bladder so this door close the vesicle and here is producing enzymes and the pre is digest here you can see some uh, one insect okay inside the, the bladder and here is the vesicles here a uh, uh, same picture of dr Placknell, and this is this is the, the the trap of the species it's, it's very interesting because there is a lot of material inside the traps not only debris from the prey but also a lot of algae small algae for instance how you can see here in this image and and also algae but also a lot of protozoas and also a lot of bacteria and curiously these small organisms can live inside the bladder hmm. possibly there is a relation between all these animals okay so this small microorganism possibly can benefit themselves by the nutrients inside here, the bladder. Indeed, we have a microcosm inside of a bladder, a very, a very uh, unusual and also specific environment inside and isolated more or less from the outer environment. Uh, considering the organs is not so, usually is not so, actually it's a little trick to, to differentiate the different organs in the group. For instance, sometimes it's difficult to understand what, what is a leaf, indeed a leaf in a tricolor, what is a, a stem, for instance. And so we can, uh, following the germination, the post-germination, post-germination development, we can have some clues about the organs to recognize some organs of these plants. These plants usually doesn't have them, don't have two cotyledons, for instance, as, as most of Eldicots, for instance. The plant has not a regular uh, organization cons comparing to other angiosperms. Well, there is an approach called diffuser barium morphology. It's a fan approach, and this idea since according to Agnes Arber, the responsible of this idea, the most important 
for, uh, uh, author for this idea, the idea of her is that this org the organs cannot be classified as uh, structural categories, well-defined categories, for instance, roots, stems, leaves, okay? It's uh, possibly for some species, there is a gradient between these structures so is we cannot see boundaries between different organs that is the idea this is the fusor bear morphology as was called uh, after arbor of course and interesting this approach fits well not only for other groups but also into Asia. possibly this idea of find defined organs is not uh is not so easy Possibly we have some intermediate organs considering this the, the, the bulk land of these species. Well, and considering the genomic characteristics of these plants, here you can see the genome size of, of Lentibulariasa. And here you can see some Genlisia species, Genlisia here. Mm. Look here, we have Genlisia margaretia, Genlisia aurea, and also here we can see other Genlisia species. Well, this line represents the Arabidopsis genome size, and realize that in Lentibularacea, some species have very small genomes. And also, in the same genus, we can find not small genomes, okay? So, this is very interesting to study the genome evolution of these plants why for some plants from some to some lineage it's occurring a shrinkage of the genome why why some some species of the same group has big genomes why some species of the same group have very teeny very small genomes this is a very curious a very interesting question and when we realize here a phylogeny of the group we can find some very small genomes like in blue this lineage here in blue and the shrinkage of the genomes has a reason different times in the evolutionary history of this group but why we don't know indeed we have some ideas but we don't know and this is also the questions one of the questions we have in our research group Possibly there is some reason, reason we don't know. Well, here it's possible to see the, 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 the chromosomes of some species. Here, Paris japonica, the biggest genome is the genome no for angiosperms. And here we can see some utricularia, utricularia neotioides, here the size, utricularia reniformis. We, uh, in this year, we published the genome for this species. And here is Genlisia aurea, very teeny. Well, considering the evolution, the Bopland evolution, it's possible to see here Utriculara and Genlisia are a sister group to Pinguicula. Look that Pinguicula has, the species have a more regular Bopland with typical leaves and also roots, but to this group, the roots, uh, the, the, the species lack roots, okay? the loss of roots possibly occurred here to this ancestral, the ancestral to Tricolara and Genlisia species. So this group is very specialized and there is some interesting characteristics considering not only the, 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 lack, the, looks, the lack of roots but also other traits. Well, I will show you some points we are studying Okay, considering the lentibular reaction. And this is the main objectives of our research group. And in our lab, we have undergrad and also master and also PhD and postdoc student, postdoc researchers. Okay, and this is the main objectives to study systematics and natural history of the species, to study the relationships within and among the major lineage, genera species and also populations, phylogeography, to identify the evolutionary history of morphological structures and organs, this is also a aim of our group, and to study also the genes and the genomic architecture and evolution, what is happening 
with the genes? What is happening with the genomes? Why the genome is shrinking? We don't know. We are trying to <laughs> answer this question. Well, considering the natural history and also systematic systematics of the species. For instance, here I study a new study of us, our group, uh, in our field expeditions. In one of them, we found uh, a new species of Genesia, and we called it as Genesia Hawking after Stephen Hawking. That's the, the idea. And this plant occurs in a very threatened place region here in Brazil, in Minas Gerais very pressed by agriculture, for instance, or even for poultry and also. And it's very complicated because most of the, the region are not inside the conservation units. So that's the why it's so threatened. A lot of farms in that region. It's in Minas Gerais states here in Brazil. And the idea also of not was, a, of course, a tribute to Stephen Hawking. All you, of course, know Stephen Hawking, astrophysics. But also, the idea is to pay attention to the species and also to pay attention to, 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 to the area, to the region. Imagine, uh, is, people usually are very interested, interested in charismatic animals, for instance, when they say, the Chinese panda, or even if we say some kind of bear, if you say, ah, oh, they are threatened, they are in extinction, that's, it's interesting for a lot of people because they, they, they are charismatic animals. But for instance, when we say, ah, oh, bacteria is threatened, the bacteria can be extinct. What's the matter? <laughs> if we say, ah, oh, a moss will be extincted, People doesn't care about the bacteria, people doesn't care about the mosses. So the idea, and also carnivorous plants, unfortunately, most of them at least, because if you consider the huge ones, Nepenthes, for instance, the pitcher plants, they are more, uh, they have more appeal for the people, usually. But if you say Tricularia, if you say Genelisia, who cares about Genelisia or Tricularia? So it's a way to people to pay attention. That's the, 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 the idea. And it will work. This is very interesting because some people, oh, this is oh, this is a carnivorous plant, but where occurs this plant? So it's a kind to use the species as umbrella and also with the goal, with the aim for conservation. Okay. Well, we are studying, we have studied also the reproductive biology of some species, for instance, Genesia. Here you can see the pollinators or, or at least the visitants. And here, Utricularia heniformis. Here, a beautiful draw for a plate done by a Brazilian artist, a very important Brazilian artist here in Brazil. Uh, and here, uh, Rogério Lupo, and here you can see some the pollinator of this species here, a bee, a lactid, a lactid bees. Here, Tricolor Mesiense, Australian species, and this species is very is very uh, considering the morphological the structure, considering the morphology of the flower, is not so much common this kind of color in a Tricolor red flowers. And in this study, led by Dr. Bayer Tosh uh, was done the morphology of the flower, and also we do, we did some discussion about the pollinator that is a bird. Here, also led by Professor Bayer Tosh the idea was to uh, to study the glands, the trichomes of pinguicula, and also not doing only morphology, but but figuring out the phylogenetic history of these species and flowers. For instance, we can see phylogenetically speaking, you can see that uh, there is some relation of the material produced by the glands, for instance, for the, the hairs, the trichomes. For instance, starch. Starch is more or less common for species of this group 
what we call the here starch grade because this is not a clade but a grade and here for psychoclade there are, there is a group of species typically pollinate, pollinated by butterflies but also by uh, hummingbirds how it's possible to see here so this is very interesting because we have we can see and uh, not figuring out species but per species but have an evolutionary idea of the history of the pollination which is the uh, which is the cause okay the reason for for which was the process that that arises to this pattern we found to these groups considering the evolution of pollination so these are the relationships uh within the lineages let's go here is um, a thesis of a former student in master now and, and also phd he has finished his phd nestor marolanda and the idea was to look to, to to study some sequences in the genome of these species particular this the ribosomal dna the ribosomal dna uh, has different copies inside the same genomes and these copies has some particular mutations so the idea was to to study different sequences of the same region ITS region in the same individual in the same genome and also comparing different populations and also comparing and not cl only closed okay geographically closed population but also very distant populations and the, the, the species we study here was particular giba and here is possible to see the haplotypes and it's possible to see that some haplotypes for instance the haplotype one as you can see here in this purple purple uh, circle that these species this is haplotype this kind of sequence is found not only in cuba but also in brazil well there is some sequences that are shared between brazilian and also cuban species this is very curious because we can here with this kind of analysis you can see try to figure out how was the dispersion for this group okay here is a phylogeny of a group in particular, Utricularia, section Utricularia, and consider this is the, the we, we can see here these blue lines. This is a, a, a big clade, and interesting there is a species that is outside the main clade. So possibly this section are not natural, are not monophyletic. So the the idea is to put it out of this group so it is important to do here and we are producing it a rev revision of the infrageneric classification of the group and interestingly you can find here some um, incongruences when you compare when one compares the phylogeny produced by nuclear dna and comparing by chloroplastidial dna and so considering that chloroplastic dna is maternal uh, is from maternal origin so it's possible to infer about hybridization in some species and that is the case it is common to happen hybridization for some groups here in this in this section also other folks we have we are studying is the evolutionary history of the organs for some groups here the same tree i show you before this this was the master thesis of saura rodriguez silva now a, a postdoc researcher of our lab and here is the phylogeny and here you can see the my the principal clades to utricularia okay the focus of this study was utricularia here we can see some species, Tricular reniformis, a very beautiful species, Tricular pobesins, cuculata, a real fight here, Tricular neotioides. Well, with, it, with this kind of study, we can uh, figure out when the groups arrived, okay, in the historical, in a historical perspective. And it's, it's possible to, to realize that some groups are very, uh, are young, 
and other of course are are not so young so with this kind of analysis we can realize also how was the history the, the evolution of the group geographic evolution of the group here a magazine that published our results and here we can see that possibly utricular area arise 39 million years ago in neotropical region possibly brazil possibly and here you can see some steps of the dispersion to australia for instance 17 million years ago after to africa 60 million years ago after to north america after to go to to, to go uh, through the bering Strait, okay to asia europe and again africa so you have two to a principal lineage in different lineage okay we have two events of colonization in australian continent and who is responsible for that <laughs> possibly birds maybe there is some hypothesis about this in the literature because this species has a very teeny very small uh, seeds maybe who knows considering migratory birds for instance possibly and also here we know here in brazil in amazon for instance we know some fishes that can eat not only the plant okay the vegetative parts of the plant of the but also the fruits and also the seeds and this kind of fish can travel across along the river for several for dozen of kilometers so maybe also the response of course that's not a case of intercontinental <laughs> dispersion but inside and semi-continent possibly this is the very important dispersion maybe well this is a part uh, analysis we did uh, uh, using a sequence of um, fra a fragment found inside the stomach the rooming of extinct bison okay um yakutian bison bison priscus this is a research published in 2014 and we they identified a lot of plants inside the stomach of this frozen animal and also not only structures plant structures as pollen and those so epidermis and other cells but they identified the, the material inside the stomach of the animal using metagenomics using dna sequences and when i realized this paper i saw oh, <laughs> altricularia dna sequence so i asked i asked for the authors and the authors very kindly send me the sequence and we did an analysis a phylogeny of these sequences indeed it was a very small fragment okay they get i don't remember i think um, 15 or 20 reads with these reads they could every tribe they could find a fragment of 137 bases and this small fragment of rbcl it's a chloroplastidio gene okay in chloroplast and we did the phylogeny and we this sequence nested here inside this group this is european species okay and possibly this sequence or was of utricular minor or even utricular vulgar it's possibly minor considering the, the the identity of the sequence here utricular minor or even maybe an extinct species considering that this uh, bison died uh, 10 Ten thousand years ago, maybe who knows? Well, also other other focus of our study is to analyze the evolutionary history of the structures and organs of, of the plants. For instance, here I show you a very beautiful group of utricularia found here in Neotropics. It's two sections or one section depends on the classification system section archidioides or archidioides because the similarity to the orchids is possible to see and section hypera well for instance considering the tubers some species has tubers very important for uh, 
reserving water, for instance, depending on the species of other material as a starch. Well, but here we can see the species that possess the tubers and considering this trait, we can realize that the tubers has arrived, have arrived to twice in the group, not only once. So these tubers are homologous, but these tubers are not homologous to this one. Okay, this is very curious because it's very common in taxonomy views. Ah, oh, this is a good trait for classification. This is a very important trait, but maybe the trait uh, we are comparing as considering as one, this trait is not homologous. That's the point. So it's better to do to have a phylogenetic perspective so we can identify the nature of each organ. Here are the other new students. Uh, about the tubers of some species here is the only species genes species known to have tuber tuber look here very beautiful and here is a phylogeny uh, as you, you can see the tubers in the tricularia has arrived have arrived different times in the history this is very interesting this is convergent evolution of course Con adaptation for uh, to avoid desiccation uh, adaptation to to have nutrients okay not only water but also other nutrients for instance a uh, starch well other focus of our research researches are about genetics to study the genes and also the genome architecture and evolution of the group let's go we have done the Chloroplast of some species, for instance, here we can see the Tricolor foliosa, chloroplast genome. The chloroplast genome of Lentibulariaceae is very typical as other angiosperm plastids, okay? And these plastids, these genomes, has a quadripartite egg structure. What I mean with this? There is two inversions here, one inversion, IRA, here, other inversion, they are very similar sequences, okay, as reflected, because they are almost the same sequence, but inverted, they are in different, in different directions when we consider in the sequence this trend. And <clears throat> two, uh, two sequences, two fragments that unique, okay, that are unique, single copied, a large one here and a small one here. That's the why we call the quadripartite structure. This is very common in chloroplast. And for plant, when you considering phylogeny, it's very common to use chloroplast genes because the chloroplast genes are more or less conserved between all the groups, okay? But for plants, mitochondrial DNA is very complicated because there is a lot of uh, um, the mitochondria. When you compare, when, when you compare different species, usually are very different. There is a lot of possibly recombination, maybe atheroplasmy also, and so that's the why they are so different. So it's very tricky. To not to sequence to, to sequence the mitochondrial DNA, but to assemble the mitochondrial DNA, and this is a study that we we did about the mitochondria of Tricularia, uh, Tricularia reniformis, and Sara was one of the responsible, the first author, and now we have other students, for instance Ramon, a PhD student, and also Fernando Mai, an undergrad student. And the idea is to pay more attention to the mitochondria of the plant and to understand the evolution, not only to understand the architecture of this genome, but also the evolutionary history of some genes. That's the idea. And that's the why we are looking for the different genes of the mitochondria and to analyze by a phylogenetic point of view, the history of each genes. And very curious because it's common, for instance, uh, the, 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 the 
some genes are transferred are transferred from the mitochondria to nucleus the, from the nucleus of the mitochondria and this horizontal trans, transferring is problematic when we are assembling these genomes here we can see a synthetic, synthetic analysis and it's possible to see also some inversions inside the genome Okay, this analysis is very interesting because you can see what is happening inside the same molecule. Also, we can do the phylogeny of the group. Okay, using mitochondria, for instance, we can look for the genes, not only the genes, but we can also use the spacers between the genes and do the phylogeny. This is very important to phylogeny. Here, we is a phylogenetic analysis also using now chloroplast, not mitochondria. And it, how you, you can figure out here, the, the size of genomes are very, are very similar between the species, not only considering lentibular lentibularyase, but also lamialis as a whole, okay? Um, well, when we study um, some few genes, we are studying phylogenetics. When we are studying a lot of genes, the genomes, we are doing phylogenomics, but always phylogenetics, okay? <laughs> it's just a, a way of, of treat, but always, always phylogenetics. Here you can see the, the chloroplast of a tricolor reniformis and the same structure, a quadripartite st structure. Uh, here we can see a, a single uh, a, a small single copy here, we can see the large single copy, okay? And here the two inversions, IRB and IRA as I told. Uh, interesting, when we have different genomes, we can looking for the shared genes and also looking for the um, unique genes for each genome. And as you can figure out, the, the number of genes for each species are different considering the different genomes because it's common the loss of some genes to some species. It's common pseudo, uh, pseudogenization. For instance, some genes lack, uh, lack its activity, lack its function. They suffer uh, some mutations okay so this is interesting because we can so try to understand the most important okay genes essential genes and those some which genes that possibly are not essential okay that's the idea well considering um considering the, vol the color evolution in Utricularia. When we do a phylogenetic analysis, we can realize that the purple flower, the, this color are uh, plesiomorphic, are primitive, and other colors are derived, okay? Well, there is a group of plants, possibly different species, but uh, here we are treating as in, in some systems as a unique species of Tricularia medicina, and this species is very polymorphic, and in the same species, there is plant purple flowered, white flowered, okay, in different forms, as you can verify here, and also yellow flowered in the same species. And the idea of this study is to try to understand why was the reasons, why was the processes that has have driv driven to these different colors. And so what we did, we sequenced the transcriptome, the transcriptomes of different forms of this plant, of the corolla. We sequenced the transcriptome of yellow flowered plants, and also we sequenced the transcriptomes of the purple flowered and also the white flowered. Well, look here again. Realize that when we say species with white flowers, sorry, with yellow flowers, we are uh, 
calling, we are referring to different groups. Realize that the yellow flower are reason different times in the history of this group. So possibly there is maybe some uh, modification is occurring, maybe for convergent evolution, we don't know, but from the genetic perspective, there are some mut mutations possibly is, ha is happening here, and they are responsible for to these transformations. When we considering the transitions from purple to yellow, or yellow to purple, white to purple, or purple to white, we can find these uh, proportions. I will explain here. For instance, it's 44% common to find this transition purple to white, but it's very hard to find the transition from white to purple. What does this tell us? The same is to, to the yellow. Is more or less common or at least more frequent to find the transition to pur purple to yellow than yellow to purple. This shows us that possibly this is the more, uh, this is the plesiomorph form and possibly the, uh, more genes are related to this kind of color, okay? So, but so why here is my frequent is more frequent this transformation from uh, purple to white possibly because mutations some mutation okay of course they are stochastic mutations some mutation is occurring here that is by choice that is that are the responsible to the white color, but it's more, it's hard to happen, it's tricky to back to the purple because the genes here are lost. So how a white flower can go back to the purple flower? And considering these colors, we know that for flowers, the colors are defined by different genes, a lot of genes, some dozens of genes, okay? And they're responsible for the color of the purple, for instance, uh, some yellow also are the genes, re genes related to flavonoid path. How can you see here? And what we what I show, I'm showing, I'm, I am showing for you here. Here is possible to see different plants, purple, we did different replicates, different plants, yellow, and different plants, white, okay? And considering the expression of the genes, here are the genes related to the colors, okay? The flavonoid, metabolic pathway. It's Here you can see that the purple flowers are very similar considering the expression, but the white, uh, the yellow flowers, realize that we have different kinds of yellow, <laughs> not only one type of yellow, okay? And here we can see the similarity between the, 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 the samples, and here is the genes, the expressive genes. And so it's possible to see here in this heat map that there are, there, there are a lot of particular genes that are related to the purple color when compared to white or even yellow flowered. But also, in particular to white, there is some genes that are different, that are expressing differently in comparing to purple flowered. And as expected, here we can see the expressed genes, okay? Because we are doing transcriptome. So we have a core, common to all the forms, okay? Purple, yellow, and also white, but there is a lot of unique expressed, unique transcript for purple, because as I told you, possibly there is a lot of more genes related, responsible for the purple color. Well, summarizing, the idea is to be a purple flower, you have to have more expressed genes. 
to be a white flower, you need less genes than the purple flower. That's the idea. And here, considering the evolution of architecture of the genes, here you can see the chloroplast, a fragment of chloroplast genomes, the same region, okay, homologous region, and here there is some interesting genes related to transport of electrons in chloroplast. These genes are called uh, NGH gene complex. The, there are 11 genes, and these genes are responsible for the electron transport in the membrane of the chloroplast. Okay, well, and here it's possible to see when you compare not only different genera, Genesia, Pinguicula, but also different species in the same genus, Utricularia, there is some differences between the genes. For instance, for some genes, the same genes, it's regular. For example, in the in the age age, and and for other species, these genes are mutated, so it is a pseudo gene. Okay, they are not possibly more active. Maybe. Well, this is one point. So we can trace the history of the genes. What is happening with these genes? For instance, look here in black is present and the white is absent. Some species has all these genes, okay? Some, but these genes are lost here, but some species recover the same genes afterwards. This is very curious because possibly is related to some function and there is some theories about this. Just one point, here we can see the chloroplast of um, the, of the utricularia and one way to to do the sequencing of organellar genomes is to isolate the, this organ this structure okay the chloroplast or the mitochondria and we can so proceed the dna extraction directly for, from the chloroplast or, or from the mitochondria but um to extract dna from chloroplast to extract dna uh, directly from the mitochondria is not so easy to do. Considering the protocol is, is more easy, okay, is more usual to do the extraction of all DNA of the tissue with nuclear DNA, with chloroplast DNA, with mitochondrial DNA. So using bioinformatic tools, we can filter the fragments of the chloroplast, filtering the fragments of the mitochondria, and so to do the uh, assembling to assemble the genome. Here also we can see the structure of some genomes, okay? Here you can see some genes, the, the, uh, uh, a fragment that contains some genes related to NDH, for instance, genes as I told you. And here is a different species and we can see the identity, the similarity between the regions. For instance, in blue, we can see more conservative regions. They represent genes, indeed genes. Usually these parts with less similarity are the spacers. So this gives us an idea uh, and lead us to, to see oh, which genes or which sequence are you do to a phylogenetic analysis. It's very interesting. Oh, I'm comparing very similar species. So it's better to compare between, compare spacers, gene spacers, instead of compare and uh, genes, whole genes, that's the, the idea. And here in this table, we can verify again the NGH genes. And in gray are the complete genes. Realize that Triclara Giba, for instance, has complete genes, okay? For each of the 11 genes, as I told you. For some species, the gene are pseudogenized they suffer some mutation. They have stop codons, for instance, in this thread. For some sp species, the genes are fragment fragmented, as you can we can see here in the red squares, okay? And to some species, the genes are absent. The species lack the genes. The genes are lost. It's very curious because considering uh, we, we can understand as the process, 
but why some species lost these genes instead of other ones maybe could be related to the environment we don't know there is some idea some hypothesis about this uh, for instance some people think there is an interesting theory that say that that says that possibly the aquatic species maintains the intact genes as you can figure out here look here this is the black squares uh, denotes the entire genes okay so all the species that have black squares have the genes. Here are the 11 genes, as I told you. Some species have these genes pseudogenized, some species has these genes lost, you know, or actually they don't have these genes. Realize that the aquatic species maintain these genes, but the terrestrial species not. For terrestrial species, the genes are lost along the history of the group. So, considering this publication of our group, these, and these results support this idea, this hypothesis related to the environment. But now we have more data with more genomes and we are seeing that this idea is not supported. So, we don't know yet why the reason of this. Here is a, is a paper that we published the genome of tricolor reniformis, as I told you. This is the chromosome of the species, a very beautiful species, a very interesting genome. Here is a number of genes. Um, just one question, one answer, one question about the genome size. Usually this species has a, more or less the same number, a regular number of genes. The point that uh, that um, was the cause of the inflation of the genome sizes, for instance, big, big genome sizes usually are because of non-coding DNA, because considering the coding DNA, considering the genes, they have more or less um, similar number of genes, okay? The differences between the gen genes number doesn't explain this uh, dif the, the, the differences between the genome size, but the point is the non-coding DNA. Here is the Nestor again, Nestor Marlanda, he is the thesis of Nestor. The idea in this thesis, in this project already done, was to look for the proteins in the leaves. The typical leaves, the regular photosynthetic leaves, of genlesia and also the traps, okay? And so the idea was to look for shared common genes or, or uh, more correct to say, the, 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 the proteins, okay, of uh, found in these leaves and that are shared between the traps and also the typical leaves. Well, and here we can, realize uh, which is the proteins, the, 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 the proteins family of each, uh, which sample we found. And when we compare leaves with traps, of course, they are the two are leaves, but the special, specialized leaves as traps, we can find some unique proteins different from the leaves. The leaves there is more unique proteins. Well, this is our group. We are here in Laboratory of Plant Systematics. This is our, our homepage. And here are the, we have undergrad students, Fernando, Leonardo, Pedro, master student, Hugo, doctorate, PhD, Fernando, Guilherme, Nestor, Ramon, Samantha, postdoc, researcher, Saura. And this is all our collaborations. And it is important to say that all that I showed for you today it's because of the work of the all the team okay and the collaborators of course are very important for our study because as you can see we are studying not only genetics of lentibulariasis but we are studying biology of lentibulariasis so as we decide to cover different areas of study of course, all of them are important as a team. So that's the why I, I want to stress that the, all the team were fantastically important for this 
as you have uh, showed. And also, I have to also to say that the agencies are very important to the structure to, to support to the financial support of our studies. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have some questions. Stop the presentation, okay? Thank you, sir. Now the session is open for discussion. You can ask doubts if there are any. If you prefer to write the questions, please. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah sir, uh, first of all, I congratulate uh, in excellent presentation for us. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, uh, my question is, uh, sir, how can we uh, cultivate or uh, store this uh, insectivore species for a long time in our laboratory? Pardon, but I have some cuts here in the sound, sorry. Can you repeat, please? Yes, sir, I will type, okay. So in the chat box, sir. I will put it in the chat box. Okay, thank you very much. Sir, I have a doubt. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I see a lot of heterogeneity in the uh, genome. Uh, that uh, this is indeed a very curious plant group. This carnivorous plants. Uh, I see a lot of. Uh, you have already said that there is a lot of heterogeneity in the genome of the plant group, and uh, you have also said that uh, uh, when you analyze similar gene, you see a shrinkage in this uh, space sequences. And there is a uh, variability in the color, the plant color. So, uh, have you done any uh, work uh, regarding the transposable elements, uh, which is seen in the uh, plant group, or any uh, relation with the uh, transposable elements? So, uh, is there? Uh, can it be uh, something like a mechanism similar to the variation of the coloring of the corn pots? Would it be related to a mechanism like that? Is it something related to uh, transposable elements? Okay. Well, ex ex excellent question. Uh, we we know a lot of cases that the the, the, trans tr uh, the the transposomes, for instance, are related to the color uh, the color flowers. Okay. And but now for now the idea is to what, what we did till now with till now with this data is to looking for the genes only the genes okay so we are now in the, in the second step and we are looking for no coding genes and also and the transposon transposon elements and possibly some transposons can be related also to the, these uh, phenotypes very possibly you're right Okay, so thank you, thank you. I have uh, one more uh, uh, small doubt, and uh, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't I wasn't very well versed with the techniques you use, uh, but I would like to know how do you uh, do this uh, transcriptome analysis of the whole transcriptome? Because uh, you know, when we do works on mammals, we do next generation sequencing and all, and how what is the technique you use to analyze widely? Uh, widely analyze the transcriptomes of, that you have uh, told about analyzing the transcriptome corolla in uh, this carnivorous plant group. How do I analyze the uh, transcriptome of uh, those uh, groups in which we don't know the uh, sequence or the uh, exact uh, work? Is, uh, in fact, uh, I mean that we haven't uh, sequenced. Uh, completely sequence the genes in it, I assume. So 
in such a plan how do you analyze the transcript plan? well firstly the idea is to look in for the transcript in the corolla only corolla because when we say of course flower possibly it's a wrong way to understand but it's particular from the corolla so um practically speaking when we go to the field okay in the field expeditions we uh, bring with us a tank with nitrogen with liquid nitrogen and we get the corollas and put in small tubes and rapidly put in the nitrogen nitrogen okay in the tanks because we have to f to freeze very rapidly the samples because well, when we are studying DNA, that's not a problem. We can dry, for instance, the samples, not, not complicated. But when we are studying transcriptomes, that we know that are, are very fragile. That's one point, okay? Uh, other point is, if you mm, stress the plant, when you get the plant, when you detach the, 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 the plant or if you transport the, the, the live plant okay, to the lab, you are modifying the, 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 the expression of this material. And possibly when you try to get the RNA in the lab, you have different genes because the transportation, for instance, because the stress of the plant. So it's very important that you freeze the material in the field. <laughs> it's not so, uh, uh, how can I say? It's not so uh, easy to do this because sometimes you have to <laughs> to go to the top of a mountain, for instance, getting a, a huge tank of nitrogen in our back, for instance. But have to that's it's necessary. We uh, there is some substances, some buffers that you can use also and put the material transport it in small boxes, and so this avoid you have to transport to transport nitrogen and huge tanks. But even with this kind of buffer, we already had tried this kind of buffer. It, it's good, it uh, works satisfactorily, okay? But it's better yet in nitrogen. And well, when we have the frozen material, so you can do the, the, the RNA extraction with no problem, okay? So you have considering the, the, the focus of the study that is to, to look in for the transcript of the corolla as the focus is the corolla so we have the tissue, tissue only of the corolla okay not all the entire flower i think i answered your question yes sir thank you very much okay thank you for your question mm -hmm. So I assume snap, through, snap freezing these plant samples in the field itself would be a laborious task. You're doing a commendable job. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm seeing some questions here in the chat. You you hear? You you read it or can I ask her? Uh, is Irija Hajev, yes. I'm sorry if uh, I'm pronouncing correctly, sorry. If not, is it able to culture or store the carnivore plants for observation under control? Yes, it's possible, depending on the species, Rajev. It's possible, some species is more or less easily to, to get to have in cultivation, but some of them are tricky. That's one point, but in general, yes. Okay, Ashish Karm, any species specific preference of food organs, particularly for tricularia? Yes, Ashish, some species are, for instance, if you are comparing aquatic species or with terrestrial species, in the past, in the past, uh, it was already uh, believed that terrestrial species of tricularia doesn't don't get prey, pre, but but it's not correct. Today we know that the terrestrial species also, they have the particular fauna, okay, of prey. And of course, if you have aquatic species and if you have a terrestrial species, the prey will be different, okay, depending on the environment. Maya, 
could you please tell us the methods used to freeze the plants in the field itself? Maya, depends on what you are looking for. <clears throat> for instance, if you are looking for um, to study the transcriptomes, so that's the way, as I had explained, it's better to put the nitrogen, okay? And you rapidly freeze the material. But if you are looking for DNA, that's not a problem. You can dry the material in silica gel, for instance, silica is enough for DNA. Okay, that's not a problem. It's better only when you put the material in silica, it's better to put the material also uh, after in the lab, put in the freeze, for instance, so you have a more, more stable, okay, tissue. But for DNA, that's not a problem. It's more tricky for RNA, okay? Smirity Raj Verna, thank you. I have a question. Can these species of carnivorous plants be used, for example, in the rice field to capture pests that may be harmful to the crop? Well, I don't know particularly which could be the pests of the rice crop, but the point is, particular reticularia get only very small, tiny organisms, microcrustaceans, nematodes, for instance. We don't have uh, actually, we, there, there is some studies that try to use bladderworts, particular in particular, to, uh, to uh, against pests, for instance. But the results are not more, more too much mm, uh, satisfactory. Okay, so I, I don't think so. It's a good idea, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes. Hello? Can yes, you hear of me? Yes, of course. Yeah, my, uh, myself, Suresh. Uh, my question is like uh, the character carnivory could be a homoplasty, right? Because of uh, similar uh, selection pressure. Yes. So uh, my question is whether uh, the carnivory in different group of plants uh, has led to any similar kind of uh, genetic or uh, gene-wise homoplasty over there like uh, whether it has evolved a similar kind of uh, genetic uh, makeup uh, at the level of, uh, or at the molecular level, in different group of plants, not in a specific family, but in different uh, group of uh, carnivorous plants. Yes. But the, 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 the questions, Rash, sorry. Uh, my question is whether, is there any genetical similarity uh, due to this homoplasty? whether different carnivorous plants share any uh, genetic characters together? Well, I, I think the point, Suresh, is that we, w one, one thing is to get, to, to see the phenotype. When you see the pitcher plant, plants, for instance, they are very similar, but very possibly the paths of each lineage was not necessarily the same. We know that it's very common, for instance, if you have different um, metabolic pathways, okay, the, 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 the organisms can use the same path for other process, for instance. So, even if you have very similar structures, possibly, it's very common, this is nature, the same, the same structures that are not the same, indeed, they are the, the result is very similar, but the, 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 the way that they get these structures were, were different, okay? Mm -hmm. Even okay. being very, very similar. Mm -hmm. yeah, there, so there won't be any homoplasty at the level of uh, genes, right? Yes, uh, okay. yes, yes. Uh, Suresh, this is a, a very interesting question, very important question, because it's very common, people think, ah, oh, DNA, Homoplasy is very common for morphology, for morphological structure. That's not, that's not correct. We know that DNA is too much homoplastic. There is a lot of homoplasy in genes. Even at site level, when we consider the bases and also considering the genes, considering the fragments, the regions, this is a very common homoplasy in DNA. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yes. Uh, can you share my voice, sir? I have been out. Yes, you know. Uh, good evening, 
good morning sir it's a very wonderful presentation and many people will came to know how the carnivorous peoples will be a good model organism you start from taxonomy phylogeny and move to the genome wise and the color of the plant so after thank hearing you, all thank the you very much. so all the, uh, my question is very simple and basic uh, regarding the purple color plant uh, so i understand there is a selective pressure turn to purple to white and white to yellow uh, so especially in the one species uh, whether it's a beni uh, ben, uh, my question is like uh, it's a beni beni uh, it's a advantage of mutation in the particular habitat that changes to white uh, or a yellow or it's like a habitat any selective pressure change the color of the plant they have the plant is mutually benefited in the habitat you are your question is about some genes that could be related to environment yes yes sir. Mm -hmm. yes well we have a, a very interesting project in our lab by now you know and this, this research are being conducted but by, by Saura, the postdoc researcher in our lab and the idea is to look in for genes related to the environment and okay. till now we have uh, 1600 genes already annotated genes for different genomes around the 30 genomes and we are looking for <laughs> is a mining work <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Imagine 1,600 genes for each species, and we, I'm, I'm saying for you 30 species. <laughs> so we are looking for these different genes and trying to find some relation of these genes to the environment. For instance, uh, maybe so the aquatic species has selecting some genes or some mutations in the same genes, or even considering the uh, rheophytes, maybe the rheophytes could be specific genes responsible or at least important for the rheophyte life form, we don't know. But this is a very interesting question. Okay, yes, this is great. Because possibly, very possibly, the, the, the evolution and the selection of the groups of genes uh, is the responsible for this uh, diversification of the life forms. Okay. Thank you, sir. I have one more question regarding the mitochondrial genome. Uh, yes. So, as I worked with many mammals, I came to know the mitochondrial genome has the new uh, nuclear gene, uh, the NEMT. It's a problem, common problem for the phylogeny. But you are starting yes. on the mitochondrial genome in the, the plant. So, how you avoid uh, this sequences from the cross contamination of nuclear and mitochondria? We, we have to trust in the bioinformatics, you know. Well, the, the, the point is, is, is for this stuff, you, you have to have a um, minimal coverage of a sequencing. If you have too few sequences, it's complicated to assure that your sequences are indeed from mitochondria. But you have, if you have a lot of reads, okay, if you have a, a big coverage, I mean, so it's more trustable it's more confident your results so you can assemble um, bigger okay fragments bigger context so with this context you are more confident with this result oh yeah this is the sequence is from mitochondria so depending on your sequencing by okay. first yes thank you sir thank you very much nice to see you here Ashish Kar, any, med, uh, any medicinal use of a tricolor yeah, in our places, it is used to keep away even power. No, I don't think so. At least for my knowledge, sorry for my small knowledge about this, considering this focus, I don't know. Here in Brazil, here in South America, or even North America, no, I don't know any usage, sorry. Mm -hmm. Maya, Maya Manohara, uh, the barcode genes can justify variation of species at population level. Uh, Maya, I don't know if I understand correctly your question, but please, if not, tell me. Well, you use barcodes to try to uh, identify the variation 
okay? Between species or even between genera, but also you can use barcoding approach uh, to look for variation inside the population or even inside the ones, one single population or in different populations. Well, the, the, the main focus of barcoding approach is to identify species taxon, okay? But considering uh, population, population level, it's better to try, in my opinion, okay? The only my opinion. It's better to look for other approaches. For instance, genotyping, genotyping by sequencing is a good way to do this, or even uh, to, or even red sec approach. So you can you are looking for not only single genes or sequences, but you are looking for the entire genome and looking for polymorphisms inside the genome. So it's uh, it's straightforward to do we using these approaches, not barcoding for population, I don't think it's a good idea. Okay? So in uh, species like in appendix, uh, we can see certain conserved uh, proteases in its uh, dicey enzymes. These uh, nepenthes and like that, I see, uh, I see them in the uh, carnivores and for uh, indigenous uh, family members also. We will be able to, there will be some sort of uh, unserved, uh, these uh, digestive enzymes that is unserved sequences, right? So, uh, is there any problem if we uh, derive the phylogeny from a proteomic perspective? Is it uh, very difficult? Can it be very uh, different from just when we consider it from the genomic perspective, or is it uh, kind of difficult to do? There are certain uh, conserved pro uh, proteins with certain conserved uh, sequences or structures. So, can we use an approach like that from a proteomic perspective? Sorry, but I have some, some some cuts here in our question. I don't know why, but the transmission is not so so good. I understand a part of your of your what what what, what you said, but not the question. Can uh, you repeat? Sir, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, sir, if we try to derive uh, the phylogeny uh, from uh -huh. a proteomic perspective using conserved uh, aspartic proteases or digestive enzymes or uh, something like that, uh, will it be very different from a genomic approach or uh, it will, there will be a uh, what difficulty in deriving that or it will be different from what we have obtained from the uh, genomic approach? Can we uh, use a proteomic approach for deriving phylogeny from this conserved aspartic of the Answer proteases or like that? I think so. If I understand your question, I, th I think I think it depends on what you are looking for. For instance, if you are if you are looking for um, different species, analyzing different species, barcoding can solve the question. Okay, and also you have to to know the best genes, the best sequences to do the analysis, so you can find some si some signal. To differentiate the, the, the populations or even the species, I don't know which is the question. But the point is, uh, when, when you have diff, uh, very similar or very uh, closely related groups, for instance, inside the population or even very uh, closely related species, so sometimes barcode is not a good idea because you have to know the specific genes that could bring you some signal to do the differentiation. Considering this, uh, um, NGS approach, uh, genome sequencing. When I say genome sequencing, I'm not saying to sequence the entire genome. For instance, if you are analyzing a red sec or if you are doing uh, GBS, genotyping by sequencing analysis, you do analysis, but in a very shallow coverage, okay? Not only in very deep coverage. So it's a kind of a genomic analysis. You do few sequencing, not too much sequencing as we do to assemble entire genome. So 
if you in this case is better to do uh, GBS or even RADSEC, not the neighbor coding. So depends on your question and also depends what you know about the genetics of the group. If you know specific genes that could bring you signal, could bring information to differentiate the population, that's fine, okay. The point is, it works or not. So it will depend what you have in hands what you know about the genetic of the group, what you know about the genome of the group, what you know about the relatedness of the, the groups, okay? How close are the groups you are comparing? So, depends. It's complicated to, to do a, a simple question, a simple, sorry, a simple answer. There is not a unique answer for this question. Depends what you, are you looking for and depends what you have in hand, what information you have. Thank you. We have more questions. Uh, if there are no further questions, we can uh, wind up the session. So uh, thank you very much, sir, for your immensely uh, benefiting session. Uh, that was a very informative session. Uh, we could connect with you very well. Uh, thank you for sparing your time, uh, and sparing your very valuable time to uh, share your experience at System at 2020. Let me take this uh, moment to congratulate every member of your lab uh for the contributions you are uh, doing in this very interesting group of students thank you very much okay. thank you very much again for the invitation for me it's a huge satisfaction to be here and to present you some information and you are very welcome for any questions you have afterwards okay you have my uh, email address okay you, my home page please feel free to me will be a satisfaction, okay? Thank you very much. And Thank congratulations. Very and congratulations to about your event. Very nice, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very kind gesture. Thank you very much. Now I invite uh, Ampu Vijayan uh, to deliver the vote of thanks. As we are about to conclude System at 2020 on Avenues in Plant Taxonomy, I would consider it as a privilege to express the word of thanks. Systema 2020 was organized to enhance and enlighten young taxonomists and field researchers on the research happening in this field worldwide. First of all, let me thank the speakers of these two days who has been the pillars of our program. I would like to express my sincere thanks to Dr. V.S. Anil Kumar for his brilliant presentation on alpha taxonomy and also for all the help rendered for the smooth going of this function. I express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Suresh V, who gave us an idea on the very basics of evolution in phylogeny. And I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Jomi Augustine for his wonderful session on angiosperm diversity in Western Guts. I also express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Yvonne Sanchez Dalpino, who delivered a brilliant talk on molecular tools and its application in Amaranthaceae. And let me also thank Dr. Vita Fernandez Oliveira de Miranda for his brilliant presentation focusing on the Indubraceae family. As no program can become successful with a single person, so I extend my big thanks to our program coordinators, Arya S, who is a research scholar at the University College Trivandrum, and Vishnu Valsan, who is a research scholar at the Division of Cancer Research in Regional Cancer Center, Trivandrum. Last but not least, let me thank all the participants from all over India and abroad for their active participation. Thank you all.
So August, so hi, you are here. Uh, we will be sending uh, links to feedback forms. Uh, participants can fill, and uh, uh, those who fill the feedback forms, uh, we will be sending the participation certificates to each of your mates. We will be sending the links of uh, feedback forms to each of your mates. Thank you.